and acorns and the maidu. So I'm going to give a few minutes, maybe a minute or two, for people to show up here. Going to make sure everybody who wants to join can. So just give it a few minutes. Make sure everyone's in here, and then we will get started. I give it one more minute. Still see a couple people trickling in. All right, David, looks like we are ready to go. Ready when you are. Perfect. All right, so welcome digitally to the California State Indian Museum um, in Sacramento, California. Um, today, we're going to be talking about staple foods and the Maidu and how to turn acorns into food um, and the traditional method that the Maidu use to make acorn mush, kind of an oatmeal-like soupy uh, meal um, that is, is one of the most common. Um, so before I get into that recipe, I wanted to start by talking about the Maidu and about California Indians. Um, and just some common misconceptions that happen uh, just because of the way we tend to talk about indigenous people. So um, it can be a little bit confusing when we're talking about traditional practices and about traditional culture because tradition comes from the past. But a lot of times people think that California Indian cultures only existed in the past. Um, and, and so I wanted to start off by, by making it clear the Maidu still exists today. There are still Maidu people, um, as well as, you know, all the other tribes across California, there's over 300 different tribal groups. There are still living members of, of all of those. Um, just like how near the end of this month, we're going to be cooking turkey and we might not use the most convenient methods because it's, a, it's an annual tradition that many of us have. Um, this, this method I'm going to show you of cooking acorns and turning it into a meal is it's, it's tradition. And, and the steps that I'm going to show you, a lot of Maidu people still do that today. They might do slightly modernized versions of part of it, but I'm going to show you the really traditional. Uh, way to make acorn mush. Um, another thing that uh, I, I do this field trip for third and fourth graders every Friday. And one thing that always gets asked is, I, 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 I get a lot of questions about hunter gatherers. Uh, you know, why did men hunt and women gather? And so that's another kind of uh, idea that, that happens sometimes. Um, the Maidu 
we're have not been a hunter gatherer society for thousands of years and neither has any other culture really hunter gatherers that's like cavemen you know throwing spears and you know just gathering berries and one thing i really want to make sure everybody knows is i, I just want you to pay attention to how complex uh my new agriculture is and it is agriculture it's not just going out and picking plants it is um farming basically uh it just looks a little bit different than what we're used to and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more soon um, but just when we're talking about cultures i also get asked um sometimes i get asked about you know questions that have the word advanced in them you know I got asked recently, were the Chumash the most advanced tribe in California? And that is, once again, kind of a confusing idea because the thing about culture is that culture is, it doesn't always look this way, but it's, it's, it's very well adapted to where people are and who they are. Um, so if you look at any point in history, so if you're thinking about the Maidu, you might be thinking about like 1500 right before a bunch of European settlers showed up. Might be a period of time that people like to talk about for the Maidu and for a lot of other California Indian tribes. Um, in 1500, it wasn't that European settlers were more advanced, it's that they had adapted differently. And as we talk about some of the things the Maidu did with agriculture and how they use the land, I want you to really notice that they knew what they were doing there were, you could call it advanced methods. In fact, we're looking at using some of the same agricultural methods that might have used 500 years ago. We're looking at starting to do some of those things again now. Um, so so um, that's just something to keep in mind. It's not, it's, it's differently, different adaptations, not more advanced. Um, so let's jump right into that. Maidu agriculture, um, you may have heard when you hear about early, uh, early settlers, if you, when you hear about um, people coming from England and Italy and Spain and they find North America, you will read so many journals, so many accounts being sent back to Europe of it's paradise. Things just grow naturally on these trees without any work. And we can just go out and get the food we need, just pick it right off the vine. You know, and part of that was they wanted more settlers to come. And part of that was they didn't understand what they were seeing. Because um, most North American indigenous people, um, when they farm, it doesn't look like rows of corn or wheat. It's going to look more like, uh, uh, you know, think of a bunch of gardens like you might have in your backyard, where there's one or two of each type of plant growing. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't have rows of the same thing. Also, they wouldn't till up soil you know, and, and remove the plants that were there in order to farm. Um, also, this presentation is about acorns. If you are growing acorns as your main staple food, and I'll talk more about staple foods in a minute, you don't want to be planting new oak trees every year. You want to be using the oak trees that have already grown there. That doesn't mean they're not farming them, though. They still are weeding around them, removing other plants, making sure that those oak trees are getting all the nutrients they need, trimming off damaged limbs, removing parasites, things like that. They're still going to do all of that labor that you know a farmer who owns an orchard, for example, um, might do. Um, and then they also are going to take smaller plants that they want to use and move them closer to their towns. Here's another example. And there, there are all kinds of examples of words we use that have kind of connotation in meaning that we don't think about. So I'm intentionally using the word town instead of the word village 
or instead of saying they moved it near their tribe because a town is a um it's a area where a small group of people live um and a tribe you know is a small group of people who lives in a specified area right it's but if we say tribe you immediately think of people well most people would immediately think of of people from uh, North America or maybe South America or Africa, you know, or the indigenous people from those areas. Whereas if I say town, you're gonna think more of Europe or, or Asia. Um, and so that's, that's just, I, I try to use words that you're familiar with to contextualize that they, you know, the equally advanced thing. Um, just some food for thought on word choice. Um, so staple foods. So for those of you who don't know what staple foods are, um, you are going to find out you're very familiar with them. Staple foods are foods that make up a big part of our diet. They're going to be things that um, we eat a couple times a week. Um, unless we have some kind of allergy, they're going to be something that we're eating very frequently. It's going to be an ingredient in a lot of foods. It's going to be very versatile. We're going to be able to put it in a lot of different foods. It's also going to be something that is going to, um, you know, affect our economy. It's going to be, uh, some people call them cash crops. So if you are familiar with cash crops, those are all staple foods. So those are going to be things like, uh, if we're talking about plants, we're talking about corn, rice, potatoes, wheat is a big one. Um, if we're talking about meat, if you if you choose to eat meat, likely your diet is going to include some level of chicken, beef, and pork are the three really big ones. Um, the Maidu, uh, acorns was their, their main carbohydrate, their main uh, plant they would eat. And then for meat, uh, living near the American River and the Sacramento River, they, caught salmon. Um, here's another, uh, uh, the image in your head might be a little bit different than it actually is. Uh, here's a great example of, you know, some more advanced methods. They're not going to just be spear hunting. They might do that occasionally, but mostly they're going to make these traps uh, made out of basket material that are going to start out, you know, with a very, very wide open mouth. The, tr the salmon is going to swim in and it's going to get narrower and narrower. And then the salmon is going to get stuck at the back of, of this basket trap. Obviously, the river is rushing behind it. It can't get out. It can't turn around. Um, so that's how they would trap salmon. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about Mighty Baskets because they make some very impressive baskets. They can do some very impressive things. Um, well, that's going to come up again. Um, so one thing to keep in mind with what makes a good staple food is most of these staple foods became staple foods before refrigerators existed. So they had to be things that can store for a long time. Um, and, and that often meant they needed to be things that don't rot very quickly or can be dried out so that they won't rot, which is why wheat was very popular. Uh, because you can dry it out and then you can grind it up. Things that can be ground up and put in recipes are always great. Um, uh, one, uh, so so corn, you can grind it up and make cornmeal. Also, you can dry it out and have dried corn kernels. Rice, uh, you know, once it's fully dried out, it can be stored for a very long time. That's something you keep in your pantry and it lasts quite a long while. I don't know the last time I checked the expiration date on, on rice or wheat um, or corn kernels for that matter. Um, that's also why with, uh, with meat, jerky used to be very popular. It still is today, but uh, jerky used to be, uh, you know, the best way to, to save food if you're going to be trading it is you dry out the meat and then you trade it. Um, I just found out today, actually, that uh, the Maidu will actually, um, one traditional thing they do with venison is they would dry the venison 
and then they'd break it up into a tiny powder and then they'd put it back in boiling water like bouillon, right? Um, to make uh, a broth out of, out of venison. Um, uh, and that is, you know, that also is another way that meat used to be dry. They, they dry it out or they make bouillon out of it. And then they could later on put that in boiling water and make a broth. And that was something that the Maidu would also do. Okay, let's talk about acorns. Um, many of you probably, I know that you are all across California. Many of you probably live near a good number of oak trees. So you may be familiar with these. <laughs> and I try to get the perfect angle so I don't have glare. Here are seven varieties of acorns. We have the interior live oak, and you can see here these, this display is set up so you can see the leaves. And then hopefully you can see, here, let me move my thing around. I can get a little closer. Nope, that's not working. There we go. So you can see interior live oak tend to be a little smaller. California black oak, tan oak, valley oak, coast live oak, scrub oak, and canyon up can these different types of acorns in different areas. So different tribes would have been using them, obviously. Uh, although there were some some very complex trade networks uh, for for the Maidu and other um, and other indigenous tribes, um, you know they would typically make the best recipes out of what was near them. Um, so one thing to keep in mind with these trade networks, I always like to point this out, uh, for, for most of Maidu history, for most of North American history, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of indigenous people say they have been here since time immemorial is the, is the phrase they like to use, which I, I always particularly enjoy. Um, and so for most of that time, they were living in, in their, their preferred area, and then they were trading with tribes, other groups all across North America, even down sometimes uh, with, sometimes they would end up with goods that came from South America. And so there was no, you have to remember, there was no border between what is now the United States and Canada, what is now the United States and Mexico and Guatemala. So if you are looking at tribes, I always like to point this out to students, especially sometimes I have students who are in San Diego, very different area of California than, than me in, in, in tree covered Sacramento <laughs> um, near the foothills. Um, so, uh, <laughs> some tribes that uh, live you know, that have lived in the San Diego area for a very long time or in LA or, you know, other, you know, desert or mountainous areas of California, they're gonna have very different cultures than, or the, the ones down, you know, near what is now Mexico and Southern California are gonna have a lot of cultural similarities with indigenous Mexican and Guatemalan culture, uh, Mayan and Aztec. Uh, type of traditions tend to show up a lot more there. Um, California is a huge state. And so it's it's interesting being at the State Indian Museum where I, I um, talk about, you know, theoretically over 300 tribal groups, some of which are very different than the tribes that live near me. I, I actually grew up a mile and a half from Indian Grinding Rock. Um, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, where the, the Miwok lived. Um, and then obviously the Maidu in Sacramento, you know, and I've, I've spent some time in the Bay Area near the coastal Miwok. Um, so there is a huge amount of variety. And that is one thing we try to get across is not only that California Indians are, are uh, still alive 
are living cultures, but cultures, it's, it's, there is a wide amount of variety. So I'm mostly talking just about the Maidu and a little bit about the Miwa. Um, so you have acorns. You're not gonna eat the whole acorn. So the first tool I wanna show you is the anvil and the hammer stone. You are going to crack open that acorn, remove that shell, and just take the nut meat from the inside. Um, and we have here, here is our, our first example of one of these amazing Mighty Baskets. There's a collecting basket. They're gonna go out, they're going to collect the acorns. Um, they're gonna crack them later. Um, and then once they fill up this basket, they're going to put it uh, in another basket they have strapped onto their back. Um, and they'll bring it back. And um, another thing to keep in mind, here's, here's, an, here's another example. I'm gonna just show you these baskets because you've been staring at my face for a while. So take a look at some of these baskets, some of these designs while I'm, while I'm talking about the agricultural method. So um, it's also very popular, it's, it's, it's very common to think of uh, indigenous cultures as being you know, extremely connected to nature. And that's true, but in a certain context. Instead of thinking of it as, um, instead of thinking of it as like, oh, they're so connected to nature and they've got all this, this wisdom, they're simple people, but they're wise, you know, um, that's not great. I would not want to be called simple, but wise. That doesn't sound like a nice thing to say. And it's because it's not. Um, what it is, is they have connection to the nature around them. Most people, most cultures in the world have a decent understanding, have a good understanding of the land around them and the things that grow there and the animals that live there. Uh, the people whose ancestors lived in an area are usually going to have the best understanding of how to use the land and the resources. Um, and so that's true here. So so one example of, you know, it could look like, oh, they're just caring for the animals, but it's very practical. Um, and they do care about the animals, but it's very practical. It's, um, is the first time acorns fall, because acorns fall a couple times in the autumn. There'll be a bunch of acorns fall and then just a little bit for a couple of weeks and then a bunch more fall. Um, and so the first time the acorns fall, so the food web is, is you know, all good. They'll leave those acorns on the ground so that any animals can take those and eat them and survive so that those animals could then be hunted and are also doing all the things to balance out the ecosystem and make sure that everything stays healthy. Because if you lose, you know, if part of a food web starts getting really hungry, it throws off the whole food web and everybody's affected. Um, so, they gather this second falling of acorns. Just do a time check. And then they bring it back to their, their town. Um, and the Maidu typically will use a mortar and pestle, something you might be familiar with. Um, you put, actually, I have one out here. So if you've never seen one of these before, you put the acorn meat in here. You could also put in herbs or, or you know, a lot of other things, and then you just grind it up with the rock. Now, personally, I prefer the way the Miwoks do it, and they actually, instead of having one, one mortar and pestle, um, they have these grinding rocks. And if you ever get a chance to visit Volcano California and go to uh, Indian Grinding Rock State Historic Park. I highly recommend it. Um, so here's, here's an example. What they do is each family would have one of these holes where they would grind their acorns. And this, this has the nice benefit of uh, you know, when everybody is out there grinding acorns, which is kind of a boring activity. You have to do a lot of it to get enough acorn flour. Um, 
you can socialize. It's kind of like uh, the the water cooler or, you know, a quilting or sewing club or, you know, you might see in, in older movies, people going down to the river to wash or, you know, having laundry washing parties with their, their wash bins. So it's a very, very cool thing. Um, if you ever see rocks with holes like this, you know that that was for grinding acorns. So if you have ever been out, and I don't know how many of you might have tried this, um, but if you've ever taken an acorn and removed that shell and then stuck that in your mouth like a walnut, you were probably very disappointed. Um, that probably tasted very, very gross. You know, a lot of nuts you can't eat straight out of the shell without, you know, without roasting them first. Acorns, it's actually a little bit more than that. They have a lot of tannins in them. And tannins are very, very bitter. And if you eat them, they also can make you sick. If you have enough, it could cause some serious harm. So once you have ground up all these acorns and you have some acorn flour, you need to remove those tannins. There's, a, there's really one way to do that. You need to leach the tannins out with water. So here we have, there's two different, two different ways you can do this. Um, or two different things you can put on the bottom of this structure. So here we have sand, some nice clean sand. You put that acorn flour, that's that dark, that dark stuff on top of the sand. And then you put a cedar bough on top and then you will pour water through it. Sometimes they will use, you know, a, a cloth that um, is, you know, porous stuff that water is gonna be able to leak out the bottom of it. You will pour water over that, and the reason the cedar bough is there is to <laughs> keep the water from splashing the acorn flower outside of the area they're working. And you have to pour water over this sometimes dozens of times. You pour, I, I had a coworker who was mighty say that they would, you know, they'd pour a couple dozen times and then they'd taste the flower and see whether it was still bitter, and then they'd you know, keep pouring until it no longer tasted bitter. On um, the other benefit of that cedar bough, it's a small benefit, but um, even after you remove the bitterness, you know, just like wheat flour doesn't taste particularly interesting, the cedar bough will give it, you know, a small tinge of cedar flavor, which is more, more interesting than just plain acorn. Um, so here, you can see a great example of how impressive these mighty baskets are um, because that is holding water. These baskets are woven so tightly that uh, they, are, they are usually water tight. Um, you can carry water around in them and pour it out um, to leach these tannins. Um, so let's actually, let's go take a look at those baskets again, a little bit closer. Cause I always love to point these out. These are the baskets in the museum. I'm able to show you if you ever have the chance to visit the state Indian museum, we do have even more, um, that just are not part of this presentation. Um, so a couple things I wanted to point out. It's a pretty intricate design. Some some serious geometry went into figuring out these designs. It is very tight woven. And then I also wanted to let you know these designs actually let you know what family they came from, um, almost like a family crest. Um, so you can you can tell uh, what family made these baskets. Um, by the design. And then when two people get married, they'll actually take those, those, their family's designs and combine them together. So pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to point out is just like in your kitchen where you have a lot of different types of bowls, but you'd feel, feel pretty silly if you were eating cereal out of a mixing bowl or out of, um, you know, the, uh, the gravy boat or something like that. Um, 
these all serve a different purpose. And, and so we've got, like I said, the collecting basket, we've got a storage basket where the daily supply of acorns go. We've got a winnowing tray because when they're grinding that acorn flower, sometimes there'll be lumps in it. So they'll, they'll winnow out the lumps. Um, I have a water dipper that was used. Um, the acorn flower was spread out in, uh, that is actually the one they would use to leach out the tannins. That's, that is what they pour the water out of. It's the basket that's shown over in that picture. We've got the feast basket, which is um, uh, brimming to the top with acorn mush, the finished product I'm gonna be showing you. And then we have, these two are cooking baskets. We're gonna get to that in just a minute. Um, I also often, um, the things that we keep in our museum, sometimes, often, we'll have people call them artifacts. Now, that's actually correct, because artifacts are anything made by humans. <laughs> so um, the whatever screen you're watching this on is an artifact. Uh, your pencils and pens at your desk are an artifact. Um, you know, your television is an artifact. It's, it's all artifacts. Um, now, Sometimes we think of artifacts as things that are, you know, way back in the past. And once again, we're trying to avoid thinking of Maidu and other, other California Indians as being just in the past. So I wanted to let you know that uh, I think, I believe that all these baskets were made in the last century. A lot of them more recently than that. We have, uh, you know, they're, they're just great examples of the baskets we're trying to show you. Now, what I do want to say they are the, the phrase we like to use is cultural objects. because They totally do serve a cultural purpose. Um, and they, they teach us about culture. So um, that's, you know, one little tip. You, uh, you know, instead of calling things artifacts, you could call them cultural objects um, when they are in a museum and being used to teach you about culture. Um, and also, you know, hey, you can, you can call all kinds of stuff in your house an artifact. Get people to raise eyebrows at you. So these cooking baskets, let's talk about these. Not only are these baskets watertight, but they also can be used for cooking. How is that possible? If you're thinking that they would <laughs> burn if put over a fire, you are correct. So what I'm gonna do now, sometimes I shake this camera around quite a lot, so I'll try to be smooth, just in case anybody who's watching is gonna get vertigo. I'm gonna show you this area where we have some of the tools that are used to cook this acorn mush. So at this point, once they've leached all the tannins out, they've got acorn flour that is edible and doesn't taste bitter. They're going to put a bunch of water into the acorn flour, make, make uh, an, a flour water mixture, you know, kind of a very, very uh, liquidy light batter almost. And then they are gonna need to boil that mixture, not just heat it up slowly. This is, you know, turning your oven on high, boiling. I'm gonna show you a picture of, of this liquid boiling inside of this basket. So. We have two rocks, we have this tool that's lying over the top of the cooking basket, and we have fire. I'm gonna give you just, just a minute. I want you to look at these things. I want you to try to figure out what might be done to boil that liquid without putting the basket over the flames. Okay, time's up. So what you're going to do, what the Maidu do, is they will take rocks, they will put them in the fire, um, and they will get them extremely hot, very, very hot. I've heard that sometimes if they use the wrong shape of rock, it will crack open or pop and actually send pieces of the rock outside of the fire pit. So um, the, our, our person who sometimes does 
acorn demonstrations here, let me know that it has to be done very carefully. That's how hot these rocks get. Um, so you get them very, very hot, and then you are going to drop those rocks directly into that mixture, and then you're going to stir it around. Just like um, if you're making pasta, uh, you know, or if you're uh, if you're making mac and cheese or you know other soups and sauces, if you don't stir it, you're gonna burn the sauce that's on the bottom. It's kind of like that. As long as you're moving those rocks around, that basket is sturdy enough that it is going it is going to uh, be able to handle that heat, especially because there's all that water um, in the basket. So. One thing I didn't mention is most of these baskets, uh, the materials they're made out of, are usually um, things like deer grass and juncus, uh, a lot of, of reeds, you know, things that you're going to find in, uh, things that you're going to find in, um, you know, river areas on the edge of rivers. So, um, Here's another, I like to show this off. There are a couple scorch marks here. This is actually, this tray um, is actually used for parching nuts, uh, cooking nuts and seeds. Uh, so this would actually be done with hot coals and they put them in there in this tightly woven flat basket and they'd shake and toss until the, the seeds are crisped to a nutty flavor now. Now um, I, uh, one of my coworkers, uh, who, who is mighty, likes to point out um, this and kind of laugh, saying somebody was not a very good cook because they weren't shaking the basket enough, and those burn marks, uh, you know, did appear. So here's here's some pictures of this process, as I promised: boiling acorn flour and water. You can see steam, you can see some bubbles. And then eventually, just like if you were cooking oatmeal, eventually it is going to thicken and you can see. And so this is acorn mush. And so then from here, just like most other carby meals, if you're gonna have bread or oatmeal or, you know, even pancakes, um, you or potatoes, you're going to want some flavor to that. So um, like with a lot of staple foods, uh, you're going to, to add whatever flavors you want to this. There are, you know, all kinds of herbs that might be included in that, that, that um, agricultural land I was talking about, talking about around the, the mighty towns. Um, and, you know, you're going to add whatever flavors you want, uh, scoop that into a bowl, add your preferred flavors, and then that is going to be your acorn mush meal. And just flip the camera around. So now that I've shown you that process, um, my hope is you see that that is significantly more than just hunting and gathering, um, that that is, you know, a, a complex process. Uh, and so that was, that was what I was talking about. Um, that is, like I said, that is a meal that will be made occasionally. They will also sometimes make bread out of, out of acorns. Uh, by taking, you know, a dough and cook and cooking it on a rock, uh, you know, heating up a rock and then putting putting the dough directly on top of it. Um, yeah, so that's that is the Maidu acorn recipe. So let's see. I always wish I could answer questions. That is my one. My one dream. Let me show you um, just before we go, since I'm talking these baskets. Another 
another thing that a lot of things in Maidu culture are made out of is this, this dried tule. Um, they're going to make, make all kinds of things with that, um, including when they're storing their acorns and, and other things, they are going to make silos, just like you might have seen um, you know, silos next to farms when you're driving by them. Um, that is where everything is stored. They usually use the last year's acorns just because they are waiting to make sure it dries. And also they want to make sure they have enough. I do see that hand raised. Let's see if I can. I'm going to allow you to speak. Hello. Rashab. Did you have a question? I see your hand raised. I'm gonna give you a moment. All right, give me a second. Well, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to, to have you speak. I'm still figuring out the uh, webinar format. Anyway, while I'm while I'm sorting that out, I'll go ahead and I'll tell you that um, the other the other uh, agriculture thing that I want to talk about. I mentioned earlier that we're looking at some we're looking at some methods that were used by the Maidu. So I'm going to allow Malcolm to, to talk now because you are also raising your hand. Hello. Uh... Hello. Do you have a question? Yes. How would I do that at my house if I didn't want to use rocks to How cook? How would you do this at your house if you didn't want to use rocks? Um, I would recommend, unless you have an adult with you who has made this recipe before, uh, well, just so I've got, any recipe. I've got, um, I've got some adults that can help me collect some acorns because we don't have any trees. But um, other than that, how would I use my kitchen utensils? Well, I mean, um, I'm gonna say, I don't, unless the adults you are with have made this recipe before, I'm gonna encourage you not to make it because you want somebody who has made this recipe before. Like I said, it can be dangerous, even you know, heating those rocks up. Um, I'm sure you could make some kind of soup if you had acorn flour that had had the, the tannins removed from it, um, you could do that, uh, you know, mixing water and just boiling on the stove. Uh, and I know that there are some stores you can go to and buy acorn flour. Um, so um, I, I live in Massachusetts, just so you know. I don't live in California. Oh, okay. Well, I'm very excited to have somebody from, in, from Massachusetts uh, who, is, who is joining us today. So Malcolm, I'm gonna say, if you wanted to make this recipe, I would do it by, it's not gonna come out just you know, exactly right, but if you took water and acorn flour, which you can buy at some grocery stores, you might have to look up online where you can purchase that. Okay. Um, you could boil it on a stove, see how you like it. All right. Okay, thanks for telling me that. You are welcome, Malcolm. And then I'm gonna allow Freya to talk now. Hello, Freya. Hello, um, I was wondering how you would maybe crack the acorns. I have one of the things that you use to ground up the acorn meat. And mm -hmm. I have a lot of acorn trees where I live. So I have acorns and the thing to ground them up, but I don't necessarily know how I would crack the acorns. Well, uh, if you have a nut cracker, which would be used to crack walnuts, that would be kind of the traditional tool you might use. Or the- oh, uh, Just, you know, I know how to do it. Um, I've cracked open acorns before. It would use a rock, like I used a rock to break it open by hitting it. That's, and you know, that is one method. I actually have an anvil and hammer, so I'm gonna show you again. And then we are going to, to go ahead and do, 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 if I can flip this around. So here's the anvil and hammer stone. They put it in a 
rock with a small depression and then just hit it with a rock, just like Malcolm was saying. All right, let's go ahead and thank you for that question, Freya. Megan, <coughs> what is your question, Megan? Okay, that's your question. Um, um, so when they were making the acorn mush, how did they pull the hot rocks out of the fire? Oh my goodness, let me show you this tool. I did not really make that clear. Thank you for asking that. So that tool that's on the top, which is made out of, out of wood, uh, think of it almost like a, you know, it's like a ladle, <laughs> you know? So they reach in, it is for removing that rock. So they just scoop it up with that loop at the end. That's okay. how they would do Good question, Megan. And then I'm going to call in Danielle and then Becca. Okay, so I'm going to call in Danielle first. Danielle, what is your question? Hi, we have two quick questions from students. Great. Um, did all Native Americans make acorn mush? That is such a great question. Okay, so no, they did not all make acorn mush. Um, because if you look at a map of North America, it is a very big continent and there are all kinds of things. Uh, we have somebody from Massachusetts here today. I can tell you Massachusetts looks very different than Sacramento, California. And they both look very different than, uh, you know, Los Angeles, California. Um, you know, if you're living on a coast, you might eat more seafood. If you're living in an area without acorns, you might, you might have maize or corn. Um, there are huge differences in the cultures of different indigenous people in, in North America. So that is a great question. Thank you for asking that. And we have one more. Oh, one more, what's up? What would the Native Americans play with? What would they play with? Yeah, so they, they fun? There are um, some, I'm trying to think of, man. There is, you know, there's a good variety of there, there too, but there are some very famous um, stick games, counting, uh, guessing games, um, kind of like, man, that is, that is a big question with a lot of answers. <laughs> um, I wish I could show you some of those things, um, but there, they would sometimes make ducks or dolls out of tule. Um, they would also have uh, like this, this guessing game where you're hiding, you're hiding things behind your back and people are trying to guess how many things. Um, so you could look up Maidu games online and, and you'd find some interesting things. Good question. So I said I was going to answer, I was going to talk to Becca next, please. If I speak. Becca, I am having trouble. Becca Atkinson, I am having trouble allowing you to speak. It is for some reason not loving me. So I'm going to try. Bear with me for a moment. Apologize. All right, we might have to ditch him. I'm hearing somebody talking. If the person who is currently talking could mute, and I will go ahead and I will unmute. Here, oh, I have a button for that. Thank you for your patience. Uh, let's see if that worked. Okay, ask Lily. Uh, Hello, Becca. What's your question? What do they use to flavor the acorn mush? Um, so different herbs. 
So um, they would use, uh, you know, salt or um, which, of course, you know, they would trade for. And there would also be, um, you know, all kinds of other herbs. I'm trying to think. I know. Um, What happened to the teacher? <laughs> <laughs> 